Great. Yeah. Th th thanks so much, Maria. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, that's a really kind introduction, and I'm glad to be back at uh, another round of, of QHack, and, and looking forward to more in the years to come. So uh, today, uh, you know, I really wanted to give a Blackboard talk in person, but uh, <laughs> we'll do it virtual. Uh, I'll be talking about um, how to use some machine learning tricks, or how we have recently used some machine learning tricks uh, in an application of quantum computing to a financial problem, uh, to derivative pricing. And so this talk is based on a paper, uh, the preprint came out last December um, in joint work uh, in our Goldman group uh, and, uh, and IBM, uh, and, and also included one of our PhD interns. So, so our group at Goldman takes PhD interns as well, uh, and we'll be having another round of those in the summer. Um, I'll just have my email at the end, and if you're interested in that, you know, please reach out. So given that this is a machine learning talk, uh, uh, machine learning conference, I, I want to locate the talk uh, in, in that sort of landscape. So broadly, uh, quantum and machine learning uh, interact with each other in two ways. Uh, you can have things that are, are quantum helping out machine learning. And so this is sort of quantum accelerated ML. So things like quantum linear systems algorithms, variational classifiers, quantum neural nets. And then there's another way that things they can interact, which is machine learning coming to help quantum technologies or study things in quantum physics. And this happens in lots of ways. Everything from calibrating the control pulses and operations that are used on a QPU, you can use classical machine learning for. In variational or hybrid algorithms that are the subject of many talks this week, obviously there's classical machine learning that can help on that side. When we move to implementing quantum error correction, which is going to be very important for uh, large scale applications, and in particular the application I'm talking about today you know, requires error correction as far as we understand then there's a part of that where you can use machine learning for the, what's known as the decoding problem. Uh, you can use ML to better emulate and simulate QPUs while we still don't uh, you know, have them at scale. And then you can also use classical machine learning to help compile quantum programs uh, to be more robust to noise uh, or just to be shorter. Uh, and so the talk today is going to be about this bit. So I'll be talking about how we, we use machine learning in this particular application uh, to bring down and to compile uh, better. So a quick outline. Um, so I'll I'll review what is it you know what does it mean to use machine learning for quantum compiling uh, and, and broadly that's you know in this case we did variationally trained state preparation with some tricks. I'll locate uh, this ML quantum compiling example in a particular use case uh, and in a use case for pricing financial derivatives. Uh, I'll cover what derivative pricing is. Uh, it's it's Monte Carlo integration. Uh, I'll cover how quantum can accelerate it, really just at a high level. And there's a series of quantum algorithms based on uh, amplitude estimation. Uh, I'll mention our, the new technique that we introduced called the reparameterization method, um, which is introduced in that paper and actually allows the first estimate of an end-to-end -end algorithm for doing something useful uh, advantage-wise in, in the pricing of financial derivatives. Uh, and when we have the reparameterization method, it turns out that one of the key subroutines reduces to uh, loading certain kinds of resource states into a quantum processor, so loading Gaussian states. Uh, and so this, this big application ends up producing down to a problem that I can, I can specify as a little bit of a challenge. Uh, I'll show you how well we did on it with, with our training, um, but I would like to put it out to the community as, you know, this is a, a well-phrased problem that you, you can improve on uh, as well, and then calculate you know, the impact that it could have uh, on a valuable application. So quickly, ML for quantum compiling. Um, so generally, you can use it for, it's just about program compression. So we have some quantum circuit, which is some unitary, uh, or you know, more generally with feedback, you've got a little classical control. You've got some inputs, and you've got some outputs uh, that you want this program to um, compute. Gates are at a premium. The depth of quantum circuits is at a premium uh, today and for a long time. Uh, and so you want a shorter program that has the similar inputs and similar outputs. Uh, so you construct some onsat circuit. So this is some kind of template program that's parameterized in some way. Uh, and then you train those parameters to reproduce the behavior of your original program, um, maybe with some kind of variational optimization or some other trick. A subset of general var uh, op variational quantum compiling is for state preparation. And so that's where you only have a single input state and a single target output state that you're trying to shoot for. 
So let's say I start in the ground state, as is common for a lot of uh, QPUs. Uh, I started start in the all zero state, so all, all memories initialized in zero. And I'm trying to produce some fixed uh, quantum memory state at the end. So can I train a very short circuit to do that? All right, so, so where is that going to come in in this use case for derivative pricing? So let me give you a map uh, of the, the algorithm uh, that's described in, uh, in our paper uh, and show you where this comes in. Uh, so derivative pricing uh, will, uh, is, the, is the main use case, uh, and it reduces to a Monte Carlo integration algorithm. And what's exciting here is that it's an amplitude estimation-based technique, so it's kind of a Grover-like speed-up. So you go from a classical scaling, uh, in, if you have an accuracy, a target accuracy in the integration that you're shooting for of epsilon, then it will classically scale as 1 over epsilon squared. And we can move from that to one over epsilon. Um, and so for the epsilons we look at, you know, that could be hundreds or thousands um, times faster. So to continue the roadmap, the Monte Carlo integration itself, we can break into three pieces. The first piece is to load a probability distribution into the QPU. Then you apply a function to that probability distribution called the payoff. Then these two circuits you run in a loop, which is how quantum amplitude estimation works. Um, you repeat them over and over again. Uh, for the loading distribution step, we introduced a reparameterization method that lets you break this down. Uh, previously, this was sort of swept under the rug in a lot of literature, and so we actually give the first method to really, really do this in practice. You, where we break that step up into two pieces. One is the loading of normal Gaussians, and the second are transformations that we do to those Gaussians to get to your, uh, your overall target. And it's this loading of the Gaussians that involves variational training. Um, so there's a bunch of different pieces. The paper's got a lot of stuff going on. We also do resource estimates. Um, but at the end, th this is sort of the thread to see where a, this particular benchmark of, of variationally trained Gaussians matters. So let's talk a little bit about the use case. Um, and given some things in the news recently, maybe more people know about options and derivatives than did like three months ago or so. Um, but, uh, but I'll kind of cover over the basics. Uh, so a derivative and, and, and options are a type of derivative. Um, derivatives are contracts whose value today is a function of some other underlying asset, like a stock or a bond or something like that. So the most traditional example is something called a European call option. Uh, and an example of one of those is, uh, so let's say the contract is in two weeks. Uh, if you have the contract, then that means in two weeks you have the option to purchase, let's say, GameStop uh, at $1,000. Um, and so what is the value of that contract today? Well, if, uh, the, let's say we phase forward two weeks. If GameStop is above 1000 in two weeks, then you get the difference between the price of GameStop and $1,000. So if it goes uh, to 2000 or something, then the value of that contract is $1,000. Uh, and if GameStop is under $1,000 in two weeks, then the contract is worth nothing. And so they have this aspect where there's an unbounded upside and a limited downside. And the, so this is a pretty, this is kind of the most vanilla uh, example of an option, but they can get, can get more complicated. So more, a little bit more mathematically, the price of a derivative today is an expectation value of some function of what we think the underlying price is going to be. And we can model the underlying price of a stock in the future as some random or stochastic process. So if we look at a plot over time, um, you know, the underlying stock is, is going to have some volatility. It might even be crazier than this, given, given, you know, if Wall Street bets is involved. Um, but you can model the stock price um, as a stochastic process. So at some time t, uh, you get some value. And, and you know what it is today, so we know it at t0. Then the price of the option is given by some function of this underlying stochastic process. Uh, and, and then you take an expectation value over all the different ways it could move. So in the example of a European call option, that function is to take, uh, is to look at uh, the stock price at time big T, let's say two weeks from now, uh, and subtract the some strike price K, so the thousand dollars. And if it's greater than zero, so if S uh, of big T is above a thousand, then that's the payoff you get. Uh, and if it's less, then it's just zero. Um, so this is the this is kind of the the most basic example of a of derivative pricing. 
So um, how can we see derivative pricing as Monte Carlo integration? So a, a lot of uh, derivative pricing is actually pretty easy to do uh, already today. Uh, and in some cases, you can even calculate it analytically. So if your model for how a stock price should move is given by geometric Brownian motion, which is there are some sort of financial reasons that that's a good model, uh, and your function, your payoff function f, is a European option, uh, then this is the setting for the kind of the famous Black-Scholes equation, um, one of the many ways physicists incur in, uh, occur in finance. Um, and there's, you can just analytically calculate a formula. Um, so pricing these faster with a quantum computer is not of interest. But what is of interest is in pricing derivatives that are more complicated and that are, are harder. Uh, and, and so one example of these are so-called path-dependent derivatives. And so what that means is uh, the value of the option doesn't just depend on the underlying stock, let's say game stock in two weeks, but it depends on the path that the price took to get there. And so maybe a simple example is here, we could, instead of taking S of big T, we could take the average uh, between now at T0 uh, and the two week expiration time instead. And it also gets more complicated when you think about baskets. So here you can have functions not just of one underlying asset, but some function of some underlying vector of different stochastic processes. So broadly, let's say we've got some, some path for a single, let's say in a single asset here, which is given by you know, the stock price at time T0, T1, T2, all over some big T. Then if you want to calculate the price, um, you need to compute the expected value of the payoff for each path. So for each trajectory that the stock price could take over the next two weeks. Um, so the probability of each path multiplied by the payoff of each path, uh, taking the expectation value. And you can, this is done continuously, but you can discretize this. So for, uh, so classically, a way that this is done very commonly is to, is to do Monte Carlo simulation. So what you do here is you simulate some n different paths. So you just take the steps forward uh, according to some stochastic process rule, and you calculate for each of them what the payoff would be, and you take an average. Uh, and this will converge as one over epsilon squared, where epsilon is your target error. So the number of paths you need to take is n. Um, they're also uh, sort of these get more sophisticated with like quasi Monte Carlo methods and other tricks that are beyond the scope of this talk. But that, that this is still broadly um, applicable. So what's the quantum side of this? Um, well, the quantum side is based on uh, amplitude estimation, and and there's a paper by Ashley Montanaro in 2015 that kind of outlines the the kind of basics uh, flow, this flow of, of low distribution, apply the payoff, and then do amplitude estimation in the loop. So to do this on a quantum computer, the first thing you need to do is load a distribution over all paths. So I want to represent in my quantum memory each path on some register of uh, n t qubits, and then I want the amplitude uh, of each path. Um, so I, I apologize, this should actually say square root uh, of the probability of that path. So the way we do that is we use uh, t different quantum registers. So we have a register for each time step. And then in each time step, we have a register with n qubits that represents the price. So there's two to the n different prices that the stock could take at yeah, time zero. We know what it is, it's here. And then there's two of the n different prices it could take in the next time step. Um, and so we move it forward this way. So each path is represented uh, by nt qubits. And so our goal is to load. So if that's the, that's the base register, we, we now need to load the probabilities that, that correspond to uh, the likelihood of each additional path. And in general, so this is a classical distribution, but in general, it's exponentially hard to load. Um, but there were some results from sort of the early 2000s that folks often point to that um, if you have, if this distribution P of, of omega is efficiently integral, um, then there's also an efficient quantum algorithm for loading that distribution. And so sometimes in thinking about these applications, people will say, okay, that's enough. If, it, you know, if this is efficient, then you, there's an efficient quantum algorithm and we're all good. 
Um, but in fact, this doesn't work in practice. There are some hidden uh, costs and other and other variables and sc that scale in this uh, in this Grover Rudolph method. Um, that means that th this doesn't apply. And, I, and this is talked about a little more in the appendix of our paper, but um, uh, I don't have time to go over all the details right now. Suffice it to say, if you see someone saying, you know, we can load it with Grover Rudolph, um, th there's a lot more details to look into there. So let's. I'll come back to this distribution loading because that's where the the kind of ML variational trick comes in later. But for now, let's just assume that we can load this distribution just to sketch the rest of the algorithm. So once we have uh, the distribution loaded, I'm going to probably apologize if you have a square root here. Um, we do some clever controlled rotation operations that end up applying the function. So you end up with some, you add some ancilla qubit, and then you rotate in a controlled way onto that ancilla qubit. So you end up with the expected the value that you're looking for, um, conditioned on the ancilla qubit being one. Uh, and there's lots of checks to do this. Check them out. Um, but once you have that, then all you need to do is extract the uh, this amplitude from uh, from the quantum computer. Uh, now, if you could just look at the wave function, uh, you could do that in one step, uh, but we can't. Um, so you could just sample it, but then you're back to the usual Monte Carlo scaling of one over epsilon squared. And so better than that is to use amplitude estimation. So you do amplitude estimation where the, the marked state is, is where the sensor is one. And this ends up going as one over epsilon. And just to point out that recently there have been some advances in ways to do amplitude estimation. Uh, you know, without, there's a traditional way of doing it with, with kind of phase estimation and a QFT, quantum Fourier transform, but it turns out you don't need that. Um, there's an iterative quantum amplitude estimation technique introduced by some uh, Grinko et al. and some IBM folks. Uh, that's the one that we use to do our resource estimates in this paper. But since then, uh, our group has done some further work uh, on amplitude estimation algorithms that add some, some new flexibility that wasn't there before. We introduced two in this paper, one called the power law, one called the quopime algorithm. And they let you trade off the depth of your amplitude estimation against the speed up that you get. So traditionally, you can get a speed up of one, you can get you know, one over epsilon if you have a depth one over epsilon quantum circuit. And so these algorithms allow you to reduce the depth, but also reduce the speed up. And that's some nice flexibility one might want to have. So, um, so that's the kind of outline of the overall algorithm. The, the meat of what I want to talk about today is, is how this distribution loading part works. And we, we, we introduce a new way to do this called the reparameterization method. Um, and so this table from our paper kind of summarizes some spec results and resource estimates um, for how good of a quantum computer you'd need in order to hit a few benchmarks on derivative pricing um, uh, that, we, that we know internally. So we pick you know, two very specific derivatives. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, it doesn't matter what they are, but they're, they're path-dependent derivatives. One's called an autocallable, one's called a tariff. Um, we know sort of in practice, industrially, what relevant target error matters. Um, and uh, we know uh, how fast these can be done today. So you know, we call the threshold for quantum advantage is if you can achieve this error in, let's say, of order a second. Uh, now it's not; it's definitely fault tolerant. Uh, you know, we we quote t counts of you know ten to the nine, t depth to the seven, and you know seven to eight thousand logical qubits. Um, but it's a start, uh, and we're pretty excited to. You know, we've already got some ideas about how to bring this down, and uh, you know, as we see in many many cases in quantum algorithms, when we come up with a first resource estimate, there's lots of ways to 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 bring down the resource requirements. Um, and this paper actually did that to start. So there were some techniques in the literature that would have sort of astronomically high resource requirements when you looked at all the errors, and we were able to introduce this reparameterization technique to make it at least manageable. So what is this technique? Um, so we're going to use, uh, again, a pretty vanilla standard model for the underlying stocks. Uh, so that's this geometric Brownian motion model. Uh, and we realized that you know, one, one thing you can do is you can represent that model in log space which is where it looks like some number of independent Gaussians. It's actually NT in independent Gaussians. So remember, that's the size of the registers for our paths. These independent Gaussians, we can then shift and scale so that they're all independent normal Gaussians. And then we've reduced the problem of loading this uh, multivariate geometric Brownian motion distribution to a problem of loading single variable 
normal Gaussians. Um, and this is now problem independent. So you have parameters in your model that, that, that have to do with the different underlying stocks, but you can add those in later um, if you can independently pre-train and compile really good programs to do the Gaussian normal loading step. To give a little bit of a picture, um, so you know you start with you have some crazy multivariate distribution that you are interested in. You start with some different. And this is now two, but we start with some number of uh, normal Gaussians uh, up to you know modulo my handwriting. Uh, this is Gaussianish um, uh, that we then shift and scale, and then we exponentiate to get to our eventual distribution that we want to load. And the way we do this shifting and scaling, um, this is what I call reparameterization, is not by changing the amplitudes, but by relabeling the axes. Um, so if we slowed the normal Gaussians from minus one to one, uh, we can do quantum arithmetic on the registers to affect the uh, shifting and scaling that we target, right? So this one gets a bit thinner, and we shift it to be around a half, minus a half, and this one gets a bit wider, and, and we shift it. So that's sort of the reparameterization trick. So the, the the big takeaway here is that you know the, if you want to load some complicated multi-distribution, multi-dimensional distribution of underliers in this model, then you can reduce it to loading normal Gaussians. So that's the problem that I want to I want to talk about here, and that's where the ML comes in. Um, so you can sort of forget all the rest if you just want to focus on the on the variational compilation part. So because this is a self-contained problem. So this is the normal Gaussian loading problem. So you want to load uh, over some n qubits. A distribution whose probabilities are the square roots uh, of a Gaussian distribution. And your score for how well you do this, um, in this case, will choose to be the, the L infinity norm, which is just the maximum uh, error, effectively the maximum error um, across each bin from the exact uh, distribution. So our, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our, our, our results on this so far. Um, so we did this uh, variationally, um, and we chose a, a particular ansatz called the RYC naught ansatz with with some ND parameters, where D is some some chosen depth. So you can think about, you know, for this to to make a circuit that loads the state, you can think about different depths that you train on. And so the ansatz is RYs on all the qubits with some parameter uh, of that rotation. Uh, and then C nuts, uh, C not ladder down. And we do, and we repeat this some D times. And if we do this, then we can, for uh, different numbers of qubits and for uh, different choices of depth, uh, we can compute what the uh, L infinity norm is. And so there's some, well, when we were doing this, we were trying to balance an error budget. We have an overall error budget of about two times 10 to the minus three that we're searching for. Um, and so we, we we really want to push these down low, uh, and and so this is sufficient for for hitting that for sure. Uh, so what this means is, if you have a depth four circuit on four qubits, you can get an L infinity uh, norm difference error of somewhere uh, between ten to the minus six and ten to the minus five. So we did a, a little bit of a trick in training um, that that I want to talk about. Um, we didn't just optimize directly against the, the uh, infinity norm. So we actually started by, we, we trained by doing a warm start with a different objective function, an energy-based objective function. And then we refined with the L infinity norm objective function. So the reason we did this is that the energy-based training is in some sense physics inspired. Um, so we know that there are uh, Hamiltonians whose their physical systems whose ground states have uh, look like Gaussians. Um, so particularly the quantum harmonic oscillator, whose Hamiltonian is is given by this, um, has a Gaussian a Gaussian uh, low uh, ground state. And here the x is some position of some particle and p is the momentum, um, and the ground state is given by something that looks like a Gaussian. Uh, and we can choose sort of pretend masses that correspond to whatever our target uh, sigma uh, standard deviation is for the distribution we're loading. So we can use this to variationally search for a Gaussian state. And so we and so what we need to do in order to do that is we need to be able to measure the expectation value of this Hamiltonian, the the energy, uh, using our onset circuits. 
Well, measuring is two parts to the Hamiltonian. There's the momentum part and the uh, and the position part. The position part is just measure. You can say that's the computational basis. The position is the computational basis. We just run the R Y C naught ansatz um, for some choice of parameters. We measure, uh, and that allows us to pull out this term of the Hamiltonian. But the momentum side um, is actually in a different basis, and it, so it's it's in momentum versus position, which is a, one is a Fourier transform of the other, and so we have to run. We have to add a quantum Fourier transform after our ansatz in order to measure in, in this basis. Uh, and so we, this is, this is in order to train against this uh, objective function, we would run the ansatz for some choice of parameters theta, measure this expectation, then apply the QF, then run a bunch of circuits where we have applied, we appended the QFT uh, after the ansatz and, and measure here. Um, uh, we use some like fairly standard uh, optimization. Uh, we initiate at for each depth d, we initiate with parameters from the previous depth um, to begin the optimization, uh, and we use the best of eight trials in the data that I showed. And then after that, we refine the training using the L infinity norm objective directly. Um, so we can look at kind of some of the differences in these methods. So um, the there's there's three uh, plots here. On the y-axis, we have the L infinity norm error. Uh, so lower is better. Um, for uh, four qubits, five qubits, six qubits, um, and for different depths, uh, four, four, and 10. So if you just train against the L infinity norm, in each case, uh, you end up getting stuck up here. If you use just the energy-based method, we get the green curve, which is an improvement. But if we do the energy-based method and then uh, refine on top of the L infinity norm, um, we actually improve over both. Uh, and uh, you know we're, st we're still trying to understand exactly how this works, but you know you can check and take a cut of the uh, parameter landscape. And so this is kind of a uh, a distance from optimal in all directions, um, you know, sort of like a, in the multidimensional sphere around the. Um, uh, your eventual optimal thetas, uh, you can take a cut uh, and look at what the cost functions look like. Um, and uh, the L infinity norm is the bottom one, and so the gradients here are, are much smaller um, than they are for the, the energy, which is the, the top one here. So definitely the landscape looks better, which corresponds to the training being a little bit better, actually significantly better. <laughs> this is like a few orders of magnitude. So I want a quick a quick note here. So we um, we did this compilation, which is kind of often something for NISC processor execution, but we're using it in a fault tolerance setting. And there's some things you need to think about when you do that. Um, so the variational training produces some onset circuit where you have arbitrary uh, rotations theta. And so if you're going to implement those fault tolerantly, then you need to remember to synthesize those angles to some finite precision. Um, so your, your arbitrary theta now needs to be like some integer i times two pi over some uh, you know digit precision that you can do in the fault tolerance setting. And there's algorithms for this. Um, there's uh, some recent, some relatively recent, used to be recent <laughs> uh, algorithms from Kalushnikov and Ross and Selinger. Um, so you know you can do this to some error uh, epsilon in the rotation in in just log one over epsilon t gates, um, but you still need to you know, remember to do this when when mixing sort of variational state prep with uh, with a fault tolerant resource estimation. And so you could ask, you know, is our training that we did now robust to that discretization that we that we then have to do? So you you, you know, it might be the case that once you do the training, you get to some optimal thetas, but then you have to project them onto some m digit grid, uh, and you 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 lose your you, know, you get a lot worse when you do that. You 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 lose what you've trained in the landscape. Um, so basically, we checked, <laughs> uh, and uh, and in the examples we showed, we projected our our um, our arbitrary thetas onto uh, m-digit grids, um, and we plotted, and and then we did a further local search on that grid uh, to optimize the L infinity norm, um, and we're able to show so the L infinity norm difference here. This is how much worse it gets from doing the discretization. Uh, ends up decreasing as you uh, increase your m digits. This is the, the m digits is the each point number, uh, and so that scales. So to summarize a little bit, the uh, the takeaway challenge that I think is nice, self-contained, could be a fun hackathon thing at some point, um, is to find 
normal Gaussian state loaders that beat uh, our results from this paper. Um, that could be in a few ways. You could have a smaller L infinity norm error for a fixed depth. You could have the same L infinity norm error for less depth. Um, and you could have a you know, smaller L infinity, go, go over here in the plot, I'd have a smaller L infinity norm for larger circuits. Um, and what's nice about having this roadmap is we know exactly, if you, if you, if you can improve this algorithm, you know, if you can reduce the depth by a factor of two, we know exactly how much closer that gets us um, to smaller resource estimates for, uh, for quantum derivative pricing. And so if you have ideas on how to do this, or you've done some training, um, uh, also we're, if you're interested in a PhD internship fellowship, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'm here. So thanks very much. Cool. Thanks so much, Will. Um, I think this was our first quantum finance only talk. So I think a lot of people were really looking forward to that. Let me start with a question. Could you tell us a bit about this field of quantum finance? I've only heard it since like a year or two be mentioned. There was a review out. Um, so is this a typical approach for quantum finance? Do people use more only fault tolerant um, applications? Is there something in NISC only that's in quantum finance? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's quite big enough to call it its own its own field, uh, but uh, there's, you know, a, there there's are... a review in the field. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, guess, yeah, I, guess, I guess there's two reviews too. I think I mean, we see where I had once. Um, so I think there's sort of three big buckets uh, of applications in in finance, or at least that we that we think about at Goldman. Um, so one are uh, you know stochastic calculations like these uh, risk calculations. They matter for derivative pricing, but also for general risk calculations. Um, the you know, trillions of dollars of things are, are, are priced uh, with these kind of stochastic calculations. Um, so it, it matters a lot. The second are optimization problems, which are also rampant in finance. Um, you have portfolio optimization, but also other things that pop up. And the third is that there's also applications of machine learning to, to finance, uh, some of which are a little more nascent as well. So, so all sorts, basically, in some ways, almost every quantum algorithm that's not immediately simulating another physical system is relevant in some way in finance. Um, so there's a you know, and there's a lot of the same way in many application areas, there's multiple ways to approach it. You can start with NISC algorithms and work bottoms up. In this work, we work backwards. Uh, and one of the nice things about financial applications is you have very concrete mathematical problems and pretty concrete benchmarks for what you need to beat. And so the, you, know, you can work, you have the opportunity to work backwards and say concrete things about these are the resources required to do something valuable. Okay, great. And is there a hidden, so for example, in machine learning, I always found that, um, this actually doesn't apply. So you can't just say, okay, this is a mathematical problem of machine learning. If you solve it faster, you're in business. But uh, I always found it's different that often the problems in machine learning are bigger or more complicated or you have to know more. So can you really say in finance, you just um, take the mathematical problem without knowing anything about finance, you solve it and you've got something that works? Or um, would you say, based also on your research where you tweak in lots of different places that you need to know finance for this? I mean, there's a, there's sort of a spectrum, right? Like it, it, with everything, like, you know, there's details of implementation and, and like the, there's a lot of stuff around the edges, but some of these financial problems are, you know, it, there's been a lot of incentive to reduce them to their mathematical core. Um, and so here, you know, they, they, these really are pretty accurate benchmarks for what needs to get solved. Um, it's There's been a lot of incentive to try and you know, get rid of the pipelining things and really focus on the kind of core mathematical algorithm already. And so we, you know, we kind of know where that would slot in, partic particularly in this case. But again, it's a spectrum, you know, there's, yes. there's always nuances. I think ML is kind of on the hardest side where like, it's really hard to predict like what's going to be good without just running it and like where it's going to matter from a business use case and stuff. And, 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 and here we know, you know this kind of slot, where, where it'll slot in. So if people answer your questions with like, there's a spectrum, you always know your, your question was too general. Let me try a couple of, so there are some finance fans out here. Let me try to just shoot you a couple of smaller questions that are maybe a bit more um, technical and that I don't probably know myself what they really mean. But um, so is there a recommended paper in risk management model applied or somehow mixes with quantum computing? So I guess the, um, well, the, the people in the finance community have, I mean, we, as you said, there's only a few papers <laughs> in the space. So the finance community hasn't, still we're still learning about quantum but you maybe the question is that are there risk models that are particularly appropriate for using on a quantum computer so here we took in this example we took a very standard 
maybe like a little bit more basic, I mean, definitely more basic than some in practice, this geometric Brownian motion model and mapped it onto quantum. You could also think to go the other way and say, you know, what are the models you can do on a quantum computer that might matter in finance and practice? And that, that's sort of an open research question. Okay, cool. Uh, next more specific question. Does your algorithm or how does it relate if it does to no arbitrage pricing theory? And that will be the last one where I can't even like tell you what the question is about. Yeah, so there's there's there are some there's some the no arbitrage pricing theory is one of the uh, some one of the reasons why one might believe that geometric Brownian motion is a good model, um, and so to some extent you know that has influenced the algorithm we have here because we chose that as a model, um, but we're uh, we're not commenting on like. Uh, I mean, you you could imagine maybe using a quantum computer to break more assumptions about that model, but we're not we're not commenting on that here. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I have personally also a technical question. So it's actually the first time that I saw this integrate. Maybe I was just ignorant, but like it's the first time I saw this integration of Folter and NISC. And maybe you're actually a perfect person to ask because I saw this question like yesterday sometime on the chat. So what does actually, what role will these NISC and variation circuits play in fault tolerant quantum computing? So in other words, if we have a fault tolerant quantum computer, will something like Penny Lane be obsolete or will, will this kind of like, do you see this integrating more? Yeah, uh, I, I, I was also surprised because I also think this is, the, this is the only one I know of where people have mixed them directly. So that's partially why I was also excited to talk about this. And maybe I'll go back to this slide. Um, I think there's still gonna be a role um, you know, it, this is a great example of how of one way it could play. Um, you know, you you have subroutines in fault tolerant uh, computation, which could benefit from variational tricks. You know, there's a there's a thought that you know we'll just enter some quantum error correction regime where things are fault tolerant, and then we don't have to worry about noise anymore. Um, but it's, I don't think it's going to really work like that. Um, we're 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 going to have a a shift where we go from running on bare NISC hardware to uh, error mitigation, which is maybe we're kind of entering now, where you where you add different error mitigation techniques. You sort of add in some subsets of fault tolerance in a clever way, um, and then you'll have low depth or sorry, low distance quantum error correction. So like not infinitely low error rates, but lots lower. And there you're still going to care. You know, even if we had error correction that made our gates have an error rate of 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6, um, we're still going to care about those errors. Those aren't, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 24 or whatever you get in like an Intel chip. Um, so I think these these uh, techniques for the, maybe, maybe what I'm saying is like the NIST gear is going to last a long time, depending on how you look at it. <laughs> yes. Actually, so I learned something really new here because I've never thought about it that way that there is this transition. Maybe we should start chipping away at that. Yeah, super cool. Um, okay, so I can't I can't leave you without asking you all the very obvious questions about your work. The first question is about Goldman Sachs. So um, there are a lot of like quantum companies, quantum startups out there, and they all have a different um, logic behind them. So if you are, for example, in a quantum research group in academia, you're just like interested in this stuff, right? Um, if you are a startup, then everyone wants, has this vision. If you're part of a bigger tech company, it's maybe to invest into the future. Now, Goldman Sachs is, uh, you know, a financial company. What um, is their interest in this? And also, what position does this put you in? Because you report to someone, right? Like, what are the things you have to justify? Um, how do you explain quantum hype, quantum winter coming up? All of those things. Sure, yeah. I, I, well, I don't know if I'm going to comment on as a weatherman, but uh, on the space, but like broadly for this technology to like, I mean, I've been in quantum for like my whole career. Like if we're going to get to the future that we want and the potential that we want to see where quantum computers are deployed for all sorts of useful things, then there needs to be economically valuable applications at some point uh, and hopefully sooner rather than than later because the, the, you know, these things do, you know, there's an engine and an industry and a supply chain and all this stuff that needs to happen. Um, and so you know, Gold, part of my interest uh, and what, I, what I'm really enjoying about being at Goldman is that I get to work directly on the application side and work with folks who understand the applications um, and where things might be valuable or not. So like one example here is sort of immediately, basically all the previous paper, almost all, uh, sorry, there's a few exceptions. Um, a lot of the previous papers had just focused on um, how do we use quantum computers to do the Black-Scholes equate model faster? Or how do we price European call options faster? 
Um, and, and that's just like not of interest at all, actually. Um, we already know how to do that quickly. And there's these other classes of things like path dependent options that really do matter. And so those kind of inputs are extremely helpful for our field. Now, from Goldman's perspective, you know, technology has continued, you know, finance is becoming an increasingly, increasingly more about technology. Um, you know, they, they, Goldman in decades past has been far ahead at sometimes, sometimes behind uh, in, in deploying technology, um, and they're going to be around for another 100 years. Uh, and so it really makes sense to, um, to look at something that can have as big an impact as quantum. Uh, early on, uh, and to engage with the research community to, to kind of to do kind of the work we are now, which is share benchmarks, show where the resource estimates are. Um, we talk with a lot of folks who, who are building hardware to understand their roadmaps. Um, and part of the work I'm, you know, we really enjoy is trying to help match those roadmaps uh, to markets and applications. So, so anyways, long you asking your question, yeah. Maria, but does that does that does that cover some of it? <laughs> Perfect. So so did you ever have yeah. to lie about quantum in some sense? So did you ever have to sit in a meeting and you had to like, you know, like maybe all of us working a bit in industry, like know this feeling of like there's someone there and now you have to kind of sell it. And I think many of us have understood that this is not the right approach. You have to be honest with everyone, with VCs. So did you ever get into this position where you felt like, oh, I'm overselling something? Or can you be dead honest with your superiors and say No, yeah, I I, mean, I think you saw the uh I, I try and with our work, and this is you know the work that you know that we do at the group. We try to take the subjectivity out of it. You know, when there, there's subjectivity about when is something going to have an application or when is it not. Well, we we did the work to do the resource estimate, and now it's you know seven or eight thousand logical qubits, and like we're not going to have that in a couple of years. <laughs> um, but you know, let's figure out how fast we can have that. Um, and and that's what you know. Uh, or the research, so I, I'm part of a larger research team at Goldman as well that works on things like AI and differential privacy and crypto and stuff. Um, like our, what we're trying to do is give Goldman a uh, a facts on the ground view of what's happening uh, and then try and influence to make things happen faster. Um, okay. And so, you know, as you can see in the work we're doing, like we, you know, we, we know that this might take a while, um, but the value, potential value is so high that it, it's wor definitely worth doing. Cool. No, it was also a trick question because I know you're, you're dead honest with your opinions on quantum anyways. Um, unitary fund. So lots of people know unitary fund. Do you want to make a pitch quickly? What is it and uh, what can it do to people? What can it do to people? So unitary is a nonprofit uh, re uh, sort of research group and institute. We, we do two, two main things. Um, I mean, broadly, it's trying to help develop the, the quantum ecosystem. Uh, so that we can get to quantum technology that happens uh, better and for more people. Uh, and mainly our focus has been around open technology development. Uh, and there's two programs in it. One is a micro grant program uh, where we give out kind of fast grants of 4K to different open technology projects. And the other is in-house research that we do. Uh, and the micro grant program, I mean, they've, they've, both, they've both been fantastic. We've only about a you know, two-year-old organization. Um, uh, we, we've given about 35, 36 project grants. They range across compilers, simulators, lots of open source software, but also things on the education space and workshops and, um, and, and have helped lots of people get, a lot of people who now work full time in the field uh, had their first quantum project as a unitary fund project. And so it's a great way to, to get involved by not just learning something, but by building something uh, and to get feedback on, you know, if this thing you're gonna build is gonna be useful or, or, or not. Uh, and so the second, and for the second bit, that's my grant program. The second bit is we, 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 we talked a little about error mitigation, but we're building an open source error mitigation, uh, compiler called Mitic, um, which, which is, uh, which is a whole other talk in and of itself. Um, but if folks want to contribute to that, definitely, definitely check it out. Um, and we're very grateful to it just in terms of background and supporters, we're mostly supported by corporates, um, and in, in individuals who, you know, care about the quantum ecosystem. Uh, so Xanadu is one of our supporters, but. So is the IBM and Microsoft and Brigetti and uh, X and, uh, and and lots of other folks that Spahara, uh, lots of other folks that you would recognize. Yeah, sorry, I wanted to, I didn't want to interrupt, but I just have a, a I sometimes like find it interesting that the um, grants, the micro grants, you know, I know them usually from like development aid on the ground, like, you know, giving people micro grants of a couple of hundred euros or something. But um, so why? So the thinking behind this is that the money is missing, right? Or the money to do things fast. Um, what's this thinking based on? So because we always hear in physics, mentorship is missing and not money. But this seems to turn it upside down, if I may ask. I, I mean, you need both. Like what we what we provide is the funds, but also we've got a group of fifteen uh, advisors, um, uh, including folks from our from our supporters who are 
who are really fantastic, a lot of whom are speaking actually at, at QHack, um, who help connect projects with each other. There's the, the that there's that whole network of different projects that have been funded. So there's there's there is mentorship and community that comes with it as well, in addition to the funds. Um, but the funds, you know, one shouldn't uh, put to the side either. I mean, part of this comes like I remember when I was in grad school, we got. Um, a small amount of funding for a small grant. Um, and when I was in grad school, I was being paid about 12,000 pounds a year. And so a 4K grant made a big difference to me or would have made a big difference to me. Uh, and it's also true for folks who are, you know, maybe they're a software engineer uh, who's freelancing and they've been doing a hobby, something hobby in quantum and they want to justify to themselves that they can spend time on this project. Uh, and one example of that was, you know, there was a, um, a Serbian programmer who needed some, who had a, Kind of hobby project he was working on and needed to be able to take a little bit of time off his his usual classical software engineering work to develop it further uh, and he's now uh that then became a company that, that got vc funded and he's he's working on that on that full time um so it fits these you know it fits a little uh a little niche uh that that i think is you know the nsf can't make 4k grants and the DEUS yes. doe can't it's like it's way too <laughs> lower level um yeah, but when yeah, we get the, the community yeah. of these folks we can yeah, don't get me wrong, I find it super fascinating because also we do it in machine learning in this area quite a lot and it just works. Just like give you money, no paperwork, and then something gets built. So I'm I'm really fascinated by that. Oh gosh, I've got so many questions, but I don't have you for for super long anymore. Um let me think about which one next. Okay, sorry, I want to ask you a question about Rigetti, maybe a quick one. Um so Rigetti was also, as I said, one of the earlier companies and you had quite a big involvement in there. What was different four years ago, five years ago from now? What <laughs> so was the hard much. part? Of, yeah, what was the hard part of building this up? You, you, yeah. you mentioned to me that you ran the first demonstration of uh, quantum computing over the cloud in 2017, I think, and yeah. Yeah, that was the first, I remember that was the first industry workshop at QIP. QIP is one of the big theory conferences and there was like the first time they had like anyone from industry speak or do anything. So they put together the first workshop and now all this is stuff. It's totally different world. Um, you know, we had to start talking to VCs by saying, you know, this is what a qubit is. Um, and today, uh, you know, most of them already have an existing model of, you know, this is what a quantum computer is, this is how it's used. This, they, they know what hybrid quantum classical is. They know about quantum software versus quantum hardware, they know about cloud deployment, they know they know all this stuff. And and uh, and so it was really a lot of the the basic language um, was still being introduced. Uh, you know, the, there were a lot more questions of like, is this going to be on the cloud? I mean, also maybe the big question was, can you build any kind of quantum computer? That was probably the biggest question. Like, what is this? Is it real? Can anything be built? Uh, and today, I think the answer is definitely we can build quantum computers, they're just pretty bad, uh, <laughs> which is, which is, it's progress. That's like really good. Like, that's, that's a big difference. It's actually, I think what we see is like how big of a difference that, um, uh, that progress is in terms of how people view the field and how they invest, how they get involved. That actually made a big difference. And they're still, you know, can, now can we build a good quantum computer? Can we build a scalable quantum computer? Those, those are the questions. Yes, this capacity building. Yeah, also like uh, finding words. So finding terminology is actually not to underestimate. If you look back at papers from 20 years back, you realize that the, the words we use today, quantum circuits, this and that, they're often not really there yet. So, so it's, it's exciting times. Um, my last question um, would be, um, oh gosh, there's so much to ask you. Anyways, we have, to, we have to chat afterwards in private. But my last question would be, so somehow after I met you, I always thought, you were a little bit different from all the other guys. And I don't know the other guys, the other researchers, other researchers like, like us. So you seem to think about problems in a bit of a different way. So this is why I'm asking, did you always want to become a scientist or did you actually have other career plans in, in mind? And this makes that kind of the difference that I'm sensing. Or do you also just like, have a game, <laughs> gaming chair behind you? <laughs> you don't have the background image and uh, I'm totally wrong there. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't know how, uh, I, I, I've been, I got into quantum, information quantum computing first I, I sort of remember it pretty distinctly i read like a i think it was 2004 an article that scott uh, scott aronson wrote in scientific american uh talking about computational complexity classes and quantum and uh and it just really gripped me um because you have a chance to work on this is something that's so special about the field you know you have the chance to work on something that's very foundational about just how reality works you know all these amazing questions about quantum information and like quantum information applications in space time and like maybe one day we'll use quantum computers to help answer those a little bit better but at the same time you get to work on 
those foundational things, you get to work on technology that can help people, uh, you know, on a long timeline. But like, it's very rare to see those two things together. Um, and that, and I kind of made that 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 bet pretty pretty early. At different points, I've thought about doing something else. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, like, I, I, I continue to find that so compelling. As such, okay. as such, I mean. Like, I don't know, it'd be fun to make movies. <laughs> so um, wondering, maybe becoming a barista, because someone was asking on the chat if there's a coffee machine behind you and where to put the coffee in. I, we, if you could make a difference machine into a, into a that, that would be the kind of coffee shop I would run. Like, <laughs> you have a difference machine that, like, computes something about the coffee and then, like, out, out, out comes. Actually, what you could do <laughs> yeah. is you could, have you ever seen these websites that do automated theorem proving? Of course, no. That so exists? you can, like... They, I don't know if they're still online, but like you can you can use computer search to generate theorems uh, that are you know, and then you could get a certificate with your name on it um, for that proven theorem. Uh, and so maybe you could build like a mechanical system that like would generate a, a formal representation of a theorem for you with your coffee. Uh, <laughs> it <would be> fantastic. <laughs> this must never happen to me because I always thought my surname is so strange that I never wanted on some theorem or, or proof or whatever or equation. Anyways, uh, watch out <laughs> for your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much for chatting to us. Thanks so much for your talk and your engagement. And I'll see you guys all back in a couple of minutes.